All right, hey, this is Pete Anderson uh, here at Agile World, and I'm here to talk about product culture and get grilled with personal questions from Anna Lobo. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Anna Lobo. I'm co-hosting with Steve for the first time, so be gentle and kind with your comments. <laughs> and we're here to talk with Pete about product culture and values and dive deep into the origin story. So I hope you join us and have fun with us as well. Thank you. All right. Hello. Welcome to Agile World. Today we are here with Pete Anderson to talk about product culture. And I am very, very excited to introduce a new co-host and her name, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Anna Lobo. <laughs> Love the way you said it. <laughs> and she is wonderful. She is from Toronto. Well, she's living in Toronto now, and she is part of the Toronto Mentorship Group, which is where I met her. And it's absolutely wonderful because she's giving so much back to the community. And, uh, and if we're lucky, she might even tell us about her favorite bourbons, because that's another journey that she's on. But anyway, Anna, what's up? Hey, Steve. Hey, Pete. Thank you so much uh, for the intro. So I'm Anna. I'm originally from Honduras. I live in Toronto now. I've been working with software development teams for about 15 years across different countries. So in Cyprus, in the US, and now in Canada. And I'm really excited to be here. Um, it's throughout all of my roles, I've kept the customer at the center of everything that I do. So I'm really excited to talk to uh, Pete today because I feel we align on those things as well. So thanks again. That is awesome. And I, I, and you have to tell us more sooner or later. You need to tell us more about <laughs> Cyprus because you just don't meet a whole lot of people that have lived in Cyprus before, right? So, you know, it, it seems like a fascinating place. But anyway, we're here to talk about Pete Anderson. And Pete, let's, let's see, you and I met when we were, when I, I reached out to you because you posted this Trello board that has like, I don't know, 100, 150 of these fabulous, fabulous product management um, resources. So what, what the heck is that? Yeah, it was, a, it was a great to meet you. I'm glad you reached out when you saw it. Um, basically, the, the Trello board is a compilation of all the influencers that have influenced my point of view on product and agile and transformation. And it's just kind of my way of, of sharing it forward. And it also selfishly allows me to, to, give to give people a link as opposed to having to retype the same email over and over again about the things that I think people should be absorbing uh, for themselves. And so for me, it's just, it's kind of fun at this point to go back and look at it because it just kind of shows the path that I've been on for the last seven years or so uh, in this product space. Yeah, and and it is awesome, and it will be uh, in 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 the show notes. So what, when so after the podcast, if you want to listen, go to the show notes, you'll be able to find that Trello board. It is fabulous, and and Anna and Pete will remind me to put it up there because sometimes I forget. So anyway, <laughs> so so Pete, how in the heck did you come to this whole concept of product? culture and stuff. Where did it all start? <laughs> yeah, so I, I've been in, um, I've been an application uh, development or software solutioning for the better part of 25 years in various capacities. I'm, I'm not a techie by trade, so I'm kind of a recovering business analyst, project manager, program manager for the first uh, 15 years or so. And then uh, when I was working at a, a big old retailer uh, that was going through a large scale change from project uh, to product, I really kind of stumbled into it as, as, as part of that effort. Um, I was in a operations team or an operations team that was kind of sitting between technology and quote unquote the business, uh, the way that we used to talk about it. And um, I was accountable for helping folks that had never really done software work before understand uh, the ways of working that come along uh, originally with traditional project management and then subsequently with uh, agile ways of working. And so I dove in during that position and kind of learned um, all about it myself and realized that, oh, you know, back when I was a BA, when I was about 21 at a big old bank, I actually did this. Like I sat down with two developers and I was basically the customer, but I was also helping provide um, all the context and design feedback. And I was helping interview other people to get their points of view. Um, and that was probably one of my funnest jobs when I was younger. 
And so for me, the, when I stumbled back into it uh, later, uh, it just kind of woke me up professionally. Um, project management and program management I could do. I was recognized for it, um, but I didn't really enjoy it. it. I felt like I was stuck in this little box and um, there was only a certain amount of my skill set that I was allowed to use in those positions um, and literally allowed. Like if you step outside of that box, you kind of get the newspaper on the nose and say, hey, that's not your job. Back <laughs> off. Um, and in the product world, I started to notice very quickly that if we focused on skills instead of roles, all of a sudden our dynamics on what we could bring to the table were very, very different. So I had done, I was an art major in college. I was, um, I did some graphic design professionally. I did some very lightweight kind of uh, CSS driven web development and, and, and some little bit of SQL work, um, not, none of which would be uh, highly technical, but I did have enough understanding of, of different skills that I feel like I can bring more to the table than just a, a job description uh, for one gig. And so for me, that was, that was eye-opening and reinvigorating. And then I saw this whole job family of people that had to change how they were working and then uh, kind of had the vision of, hey, I can actually help make this happen for a Fortune 50. And that's, that was a huge challenge. And I had leaders that supported me in trying to make connections across this huge enterprise to make it happen. Um, and it kind of evolved from there. Um, but that's, that's kind of where it started. And um, I'm thankful that it did because uh, it, it's been a blast ever since. Have you found some, some of the challenges that you, you faced as you were trying to roll this out on a Fortune 50 that maybe looking back, I'm, I'm curious because you went from like art major, graphic design, and then into, into that environment, right? Yeah, I skipped over my whole data entry career. In, uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> when I was a late teenager uh, in college. But, well, you um, know, you get on the nose a lot with that one, so. <laughs> exactly. After, that was back when I was literally manually typing debit card numbers or ATM card numbers into a, a CRT. So that tells you how old I am. I've oh. earned my gray beard. Um, have you, have yeah, you had punch can, cards before? You and me both, man. Um, <laughs> Damn, you are. So no, I, I think the for me, the large scale change is a massive effort. So I was just one little one little piece of a very large puzzle. Um, but I, I think for me, part of that journey was I, I moved from this operational team into enterprise strategy and enterprise strategy was helping drive that transformation. And then I moved into the technology organization um, and basically uh, helped kind of take on establishing a product management culture for enterprise product. So basically all the software that runs the business from uh, getting product to moving product to selling product uh, to supporting it after it's been sold. And so uh, it, my product career has not been like making sexy apps on the iPhone or creating uh, the, the big uh, the big fancy uh, websites out there. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the stuff that's kind of behind the scenes that that's enabling efficiency and time to market and um, kind of helping change uh, the, the larger portion of the organizations most of the time and how they think and how we approach work. Um, but there are, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of obstacles or a lot of cultural uh, obstacles, which is why I focus so much on product values um, before I get to anything about the tactics of how we deliver differently. Um, what I've seen both at the, the two Fortune 125s that I've been at and probably a handful of other companies that I've consulted at now has been most places start with agile delivery as the, the mechanism for transformation. And that's great, but one of my, uh, one of my mentors um, that passed away a couple of years ago, his name is David Husman, always said, um, uh, basically Scrum allows you to build the wrong thing two weeks at a time. And mm -hmm. product enables you to basically figure out what to build and know why you're building it. And so for me, that's why I emphasize so much upstream. So before it ever gets to a team, let's, let's do better thinking up front and let's change how we approach a problem, how we approach the customer, um, all those types of things. And so the, the biggest challenges that I see in the large scale change um, arena from moving from project to product are cultural battles on kind of the command and control versus servant leadership. Um, you see a lot of tactical enterprise process issues. Um, we have funding, if we fund projects and then tell people to operate in product teams, <laughs> it's an immediate uh, 
<laughs> kind of uh, battle between, no, I, I'm not going to manage scope for the next year and a half the way that we used to. We're going to, we're actually going to respond to the most important thing um, for the customer, et cetera. So you got funding stuff, you got HR things, you've got um, a variety of like security and compliance and traditional groups that aren't sure how to keep up. Um, uh, <laughs> one team that I coached for a while was like an audit team. So if I'm an audit team and I'm managing water, waterfall audits for projects, I can schedule myself around that. That's going to take two years. Like I'll, I'll see you in six months and I'll come back and look at some of your stuff. If I'm looking at a scrum team and I'm an auditor, I'm going, oh, holy crap, by the time you start moving, by the time I start thinking about you, you've already completed something and I don't understand the process that you went through to get there. Um, yeah, so and, a, and the scrum master always says, oh, we, we can't, we can't, we can't uh, uh, reach, reach our sprint goals because, because audit's behind. Well, when did you let audit know? Yesterday. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that th those types of things are like oddly rewarding to me. There's, there's, they are, when, when I describe them out loud, I'm like, why do I enjoy doing this? But I, I actually love, I love doing it because I think if you can change the headspace of those types of folks um, and, and they want everything, they want the same stuff that the product teams do. They want, they want our customers to be able to have the best things possible as quickly as possible. Um, but they're, they're still trying to figure out how to do their job in the context of this new world. And so a lot of it is around just helping, helping folks um, kind of see new ways of working and thinking. And for me, it gets bigger than just work. Um, all this stuff has a direct impact, or at least for me, it has had a direct impact on how I think, how I approach things outside of work as well. Um, so it's oh, kind of that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. So, so, so Anna is on a, a, an adventure and a journey of learning about bourbons, learning about new bourbons. So, so if you were going to apply your product <laughs> thinking <laughs> outside of work, what, what, what advice could you, could you give somebody who wants to learn more about bourbons? I'm not sure my product mindset's going to apply to bourbon, but maybe let, let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. So the, the primary, uh, the primary value that I always talk about is humility. So we, we start in the project world. Uh, we basically justify our ideas and our biases and we go get a big check to go do a project and then we go forward. In the product world, we have an idea. We're not sure about it. So we test and learn. So I guess one of the things I would think about with bourbon is that I'm probably not gonna have a preconceived notion of this is the bourbon to try. I'm probably gonna have a pretty open mind on how I approach it. I'm probably gonna do uh, very small scale tests, especially for me, since <laughs> I don't drink a lot. Um, Anna may be able to down four ounces of pop, but not me. Um, and then uh, the, the, the other values that, that I always talk about are empathy, passion, and curiosity. So kind of the, the growth mindset being really passionate about what you're working on um, and, and the space that you're in and the product that you have, and then being empathetic uh, for, for those around you. Um, so for you, it sounds like you're passionate about bourbon. So, and you've got a growth <laughs> mindset to learn about the different types that are out there and the different flavor profiles. This, this is working, Steve. I, I didn't think it was going to work. Um, <laughs> the, the delivery values that, that we talked about or that I normally talk about are biased toward action. Uh, kinship, which is basically the concept of a high-performing team that shares um, audacious goals, values, uh, oh. etc. And then last but not least, focus. Goals. Audacious. Audacious. audacious goals, a shared values, a, a shared um, uh, kind of vision for where they're headed, um, and willing to, to, to go after something that it's likely they won't achieve, um, and, and, but work at it really, really hard uh, to try to make it happen. Um, honestly, that's what made the experience at that retailer such a big deal for me is that we had a, a solid team of 15 to 20 coaches uh, in our uh, kind of immersive learning environment. Um, and we knew that uh, the task ahead of us was massive. Um, mm -hmm. And we did it for four years straight. And every one of us, I think, left that experience about six inches taller, just kind of feeling like, look, look what we've done, man. Like, this place has, has quintupled their stock price. Um, you've got people that are engaged and excited about working there. Um, it was hard. We lost like 35% of the, the people at headquarters mm -hmm. because of the, the new roles and responsibilities and how, how kind of 
fat the organization was on overlapping roles and those types of things. Um, but all that said, uh, bias toward action would be that we should probably start drinking bourbon soon. Um, <laughs> so we can pass as quickly as possible. And then uh, radical focus, right? That was- Yeah, 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 like ruthless focus, yeah. Ruthless radical focus, focus yeah. Is, is a great book, um, but ruthless focus was actually one that um, Jeff Patton, when Jeff Patton was weighing in on the values, that was, I didn't have that there. It was, it was like something around enterprise before local team or something like that. And he's like, these are all too soft. You need a dark value. You need a hard, <laughs> hard value that kind of cuts through um, some of the hard decisions that you have to have and hard discussions that you have to have. So um, the, the, those values have been uh, shaped by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. This uh, product values, uh, are, are you applying it to something else right now or do you want to apply it to something else? Is there an area that you're looking at? Yeah, so, so for me, the, I'm, I'm basically trying to apply it to beyond bourbon. I'm trying, beyond to, apply bourbon, it yes. to, I'm trying to translate <laughs> the behavior, I should say the values into behaviors and, and basically look at kind of each layer of the organization as well as different pockets of the organization. What, what does it mean to have, if, if I'm in, um, if I'm a senior leader, what does it mean to show up as a humble senior leader? What does it mean to be empathetic in that role versus what it means to be empathetic as a developer or empathetic as an auditor, um, so on and so forth. And so I'm, I'm essentially uh, working to map uh, the values to those behaviors uh, kind of by role and by, by level in the organization. I'm mm -hmm. also working on a book very, very, very slowly um, that is tentatively titled Stuck in the Middle, um, which is basically all about these middle management folks that are exactly that. Um, you have senior leaders that go off and buy a transformation, um, and they basically say, I want faster uh, time to, to market, and I want better quality, and I want to save money, and th that's what they're buying. And then we've got the people closest to the customer, the, the teams that are actually building stuff, they're actually um, basically really excited about learning new ways of working. I'm going to be empowered. I'm going to be able to help my customer in better ways. I've always wanted this. Yay me. Um, and then you've got this middle management group that's like, I didn't ask for this. And now my team is telling me I'm leading incorrectly. And I have more pressure from above to get stuff done. And nobody's spending any time helping me figure this stuff out. And so for me, I've got a soft spot from uh, an empathetic point of view on those kind of director, senior director, VP type of layers on how do you show up in this mm -hmm. new world? How do I shift from managing to leading? Um, how do I actually coach instead of uh, tell people what to do? Um, especially if I've been doing it for 20 years and I've been rewarded for it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a monumental shift in mindset uh, for a lot of people. And so I'm trying to make it really practical and accessible for folks to say, okay, those values are great. And they'll look great on my wall um, next to the uh, poetic <laughs> vision statement from my company, but I don't see how I'm going to apply them. I'm trying to make them real so that people can actually use it as a filter to look through and say, mm -hmm. okay, I could actually look at a process and say, does this process reflect these values? So if we use like that funding example I used earlier, if I spend three to six months justifying my idea so I can get a big check and go deliver something for the next two years. Is that humble? I don't think it is because it's, it's basically stating that my idea is right uh, before, before I know whether or not it's right. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not a bias toward action because it took me six months to justify my, my concept. If it um, only took you six months to justify it, that's pretty fast in most organizations. There you go. That's <laughs> true. Um, and it can often and, take 18 months to justify getting started on something. And by then you're already 18 months behind your competition. So yeah, absolutely. And it's not empathetic for the teams because it's prescriptive. So we're basically saying, Hey teams, um, you have the capabilities of coding stuff and being order takers. And so therefore this is what you're going to go build. And, and these so are the literally you have to build it by. <laughs> absolutely. And this is the exact timeline you need to do it in. Um, even if it's not realistic and we have no idea what we're asking for. Yeah, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, so it, they kind of all apply. Um, I, I should say it, it can, you can use it for just about anything as a filter and just kind of ask yourselves and, and ask each other as an organization, hey, is the way that we're inter interacting um, mm -hmm. something that's actually demonstrating empathy? I've got one client right now that's got a bunch of new people 
that have just joined. Super smart. They know exactly what they're doing with product and, and a lot of other things in that transformation space. And they've got folks that have been at this company for 20 or 30 years that have all the domain knowledge in the world, but have no understanding of what the new folks know. And right now, there's, there hasn't been a whole lot of empathy for those folks that have been there forever. And so it's pretty tough to kind of keep them aligned and make them feel safe um, because it, at this point, it's scary to have all these people know stuff that I don't. Um, I know that's the way that we have to work. So I don't feel like I'm in a good spot. Um, mm -hmm. And so any change is human change. And it's got to be led, from my perspective, with, with values first and then the tactics second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the fact that you're focusing on on empathy for middle management. Yeah, uh, because it, it, it's true. There's these directors, they have been rewarded. They've been excellent at what, what they do. They've done it better than anyone else in the company. And they were really the backbone for so many years. And now we're asking them to change a little bit. And it's hard. And yep. you know what? 90% of them, almost all of them really want to. They really love to get on board. But if we don't spend time with that, we just don't. Yep. You know, and if you look at the Scrum Guide, which is wonderful, and a lot of the Agile practices, they don't talk about that type of leadership or where that goes. Yeah. Well, and really a collaboration, right? I think the, the other thing that we tend to do is that we, especially in large scale change, is that it's really easy to look at numbers of people in job families and then figure out a training plan for each job family and forget about the fact that it's yes, we have to build competency in, the, in those individuals within their individual silos, but the hardest part and the part where it's worth the most investment is bringing those cross-functional teams together and having them learn together on how to work uh, with one another. Mm -hmm. And so I've had people say, like, when we've tried to set that up, it's like, well, I don't need to go to that training because I already know how to do personas and an opportunity campus and story <laughs> mapping. And I'm like, yeah, but you've never done it here. And you've never done it with these people around you. And yep. if, if you can look beyond your own skill and your own ego to recognize that there's actually value in learning this stuff together. And if you've done it a different way, that's great. Bring it up during the class and bring it up with uh, your, your group and basically yes, be able yes. to say, as long as, you, as long as it's serving the same purpose, I could care less about the tactics that you use. If you don't like, um, uh, Jeff Patton's opportunity canvas for figuring out value for the customer and for the business, then do a different tool. And that's fine. But it, it is the whole team needs to understand why you would do something. And then you can riff off of um, any variant of, of the types of tools that you want to use. Mm -hmm. um, but that people connection is, is so important. Otherwise you end up with this, everybody wanting to do a racy on um, like what, <laughs> No, the designer has to do that. There's nobody else in the world that can do that except the designer. Yeah. No, there's nobody else that can do that except the product owner. And that's where I, I, when I was talking about skills and roles earlier, I'm just absolutely allergic to that thought process because I'm so excited about everybody bringing themselves to bear 100% of the skills that they have and the experiences that they have. I think yeah, and I love, I love you bring out the, the conversations. I know a director who went to went to a class that I taught three times. Mm. It, it was the, the, the safe POPM. Yes. Yeah. It was there all three times. Not, you know, not maybe a hundred percent the, the second and third time, but he was there because he wanted to hear the conversations. Oh, and, when, when, and when somebody was, when somebody was, was asked, was asking him about it, he's like, cause I want to hear the, con I want to hear the chat. I want to hear the chatter and, and know how everybody's feeling. And I can't do that by sitting in my office. Yes. Oh, the material We've covered. I've already passed the exam, so I know the material. But still, we need to we need to do that. So that that's that's brilliant. Anna, it looks like you want to say something. You got a big question. How does this apply to you? <laughs> There's so many questions. Um, <laughs> I so see your head just spinning. I I will let you pick, Pete. Okay. All right. So yeah. pick the thread. Ooh, this okay. The so one is um, I hear empathy a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And so. You know, when, when we think of art majors, we think of people who are really creative and sensitive as well, mm -hmm. right? Graphic design, you need to kind of understand, right? What is it that I'm creating, right? And, and you also have this host leadership thread as well, because you're part of so many communities as well, and you create that space, right? 
So one thread is going into that personal space. I'm, I'm curious because I, I did watch a few of your videos and you did mention a little bit about um, your, your family growing up. Right. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how, how do we connect, you know, bringing back that whole self, right? The, the theme that you've had throughout your career and the teams that you've been working with to have that empathy and kind of your origin story around that. Yeah. Um, um, so that's Absolutely. one thread. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. That's one. Okay. What's, what's the other option. The other option is um, shared ownership. So I struggled quite a bit with this, where it's you know everybody's on a different table symbolically, right? Yeah. You know, my team, your team, my role, your role. And if my I bonus, see this, bonus. right? And and we're a system within our table, but we're part of a larger system within the organization, yeah. and the organization is part of a larger system, right? and so on and so forth. So one of my challenges is how do we create that sense of shared ownership where if I see that something is out of place there, let me raise my hand and go talk to you, right? So when you, when you are part of those large scale transformations, even the small scale ones, right? Like I've been part of so many different teams and company sizes, it's a, yeah. it's a pattern. It's part of the system itself sometimes, right? Yeah. So how do you address that as well? I don't know if you could pick two different threads to go down or two more <laughs> different threads to go down. One, I feel like I got to cut a vein and the other one I get, I get to totally escape and just, it's all about shared objectives. Um, no, the, the um, uh, maybe we'll do a little bit of both. Uh, the, I, I think the, the shared ownership component, um, again, is, is in my mind, it's truly a cultural thing. I always talk about redefining team. So when I first started working at, um, I was at another large bank as part of their transformation. And I'd, I'd come in and do a workshop and I'd ask people to introduce themselves. And without exception, it would start with, hey, I'm Jim, I report to Betty, Betty reports to Ed, Ed reports to this person. And I'm like, I asked for your introduction and all of you led with the hierarchy that you live in at this point in time and who the boss is, boss is, boss is, boss is. Like, do you guys not see anything kind of weird about that um, from, from the outside world that feels really odd? Um, but that's, that's how they define team. And so as we start talking to people on whether, they're, whether it's a matrix organization where I've got um, uh, UX in one place and dev in someplace else and product in someplace else and scrum masters in someplace else, we all just kind of bring them together to work together for an extended period. Um, or you've got truly dedicated cross-functional teams that aren't matrixed. Either way, what I want them to be able to say at the end of it is that I'm on team XYZ, uh, basically product team XYZ that's attempting to solve ABC problems for DEF customers. And, and so I talk about that all the time from a coaching perspective in that the only team we're on is our shared product team serving the same customer with the same desired outcomes. Um, and that's where the kinship stuff comes in. And that's why having it, and, and I really do believe that having a shared audacious goal and trusting each other to bring the best of your individual skill set to the table is absolutely critical. So I don't think you can, the only way that I've seen us do anything systemically is to start locally and stop worrying about changing the world and change the, the, the local environment around you and then let it spread. And through, whether it's community to practice or it's internal conferences, um, I've had a lot of different types of tactics that we've done to bring in uh, kind of new ideas, but, um, and that may be a, it may be an idealistic answer, but I, I just, as a coach, I'm always going toward North Star and I'm always reminding them of North Star, even if we're in the mud and we're four years away from North Star, that has to be what we're talking about. Um, and so one of the other questions I always ask my teams is that I'm working with are, tell me what it looks like a year from now. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you hear, see, and feel within your teams? And that's a change management tactic. That's some license that I once got um, and, and change management stuff. But it's a really, really practical question for people to get the, the emotional side of it out as well as the tactical side of it out to say, Hey, if we succeed in improving how we're working and improving how we're succeeding, I should say, improving how we're serving our customers, what would that look like and feel like and sound like? And you put 
like a top 10 list of statements on the board for people to kind of consistently reference and say, you know, that's still what we're shooting for. It doesn't matter how crappy this sprint was, that's what we're shooting for. Um, so how do we get there together and keep pushing? So mm -hmm. that's my pep talk for that one. Um, as far as the empathy component, um, one of the things that I mentioned, and, and it's probably the, uh, it was a TED talk that I was prepping that never got to happen because of uh, um, uh, COVID, but it, I, I did reference my family and it was a, um, it was the, I made the analogy basically that for these middle managers, it's very much like a, a kid going through divorce. And so my, my parents split when I was about eight. And if you think about that as a transformation in and of itself, I didn't ask for it. It changed my roles and responsibilities within the family. It changed the dynamic within the family. A big part of the identity that I had um, in my dad was removed from the picture uh, for all practical purposes. And if you draw that parallel back to folks that are going through it in the, the corporate world, it's not a whole hell of a lot different. It, it, it's, it, it is significant. I mean, you've, the things that you've been recognized for, I'm now telling you are, aren't the right way to do things. Um, and oh, by the way, a third of your friends are being removed from the organization because they're no longer necessary. And that project thing is a swear word and everything has to be product from here on out. Um, it's hard. And so if you're not empathetic to folks, um, it's pretty easy to have them. Why, why would they come along for that ride? Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd put up walls left and right too, if I were them. Um, and so if you show up empathetically, talk to them about the skills that they have, how they apply in the new world, how they're valuable in the new world, and then give them a North Star to go pursue. Um, hopefully uh, you, you get some folks to buy in and you still probably have a third, a third, a third, you got a third of the people that get really excited, third of them that are like, yeah, I'm coming along for the ride. And the third of them that are like, yeah, this will go over, this will blow over, don't worry about it. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not ready for it. But, um, so there's a little bit of both for you. Amazing, yeah. thank you. <laughs> and, and it kind of tied it all together from the shared ownership, kinship, and the empathy piece, right? And yeah how to create that, that environment, right? So thank Absolutely. you, that was great. Yeah, yeah. I, I love how the whole culture thing always seems to pull everything together. You know, mm -hmm. when, you were, when you were doing the, the meetup, Pete, it, it, go, going through the seven different steps of the culture, everything yeah. always seemed to be linked and, and, and it kind of seemed like common sense when you put it together that way. Oh, it's, totally. it's not obvious until you put it together correctly. Cause you know, it's yeah. like putting, putting together pieces of the puzzle, but it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I, I do believe that this is, that, that, that the product focus has to be the new focus for most organizations, because to your point, you know, Scrum is really good at developing software and it got, got really good at developing it faster with fewer bugs, that's great. But then it was all backing up. So then step two was, you know, Gene, Gene Kim came along, created this wonderful book Phoenix project made made DevOps a very complex concept, very accessible. He's brilliant for being able to do that. And yep. DevOps, you can measure real quick, right? Yep. How long does it take you to spin to spin up a new instance in the cloud and deploy your code? Well, it used to take us three days, and now it takes us three hours. Very easy to measure. But yep. the whole, but now people are realizing, well, we're getting this stuff out there, but it's not the right thing. And I think the big difference between like Facebooks and Googles and all these companies that are moving really fast, isn't that, I mean, they do have some bright people, but I think it's the, the fact that they're doing the right thing at the right time, better than, other, better than their competitors. If we do the right thing and we build the right thing, even if it takes a little bit longer, or even if it's not quite as good as somebody else's, we're getting it there first, we're getting it there sooner, and we're learning from our customers. So I think it's hugely, hugely important. Yeah. Um, Pete, Anna, this has been great. I love, I love working with you guys. We've been talking for about 30 minutes. Um, wow. so maybe, yeah, I know. It, it, it seems like 10 minutes, doesn't it? When, no, when, right. that I have one last time. question. One last question. No, and then I'm no, done. No. I promise. What you got? Um, so COVID, right? This new yeah. reality, right? How, how have you seen things change from when you were able to go into a company, create that sense of rapport through that, you know, change journey right and that sense yeah. of empathy and now with COVID like how have you adapted to that how has it changed how you approach this now yeah it's a great question I think the what I've noticed is that 
we actually have like, because we're all sitting in our offices and some of us have big purple things behind us, but most <laughs> people just have, have the, the office behind them. Like it's actually kind of a, a little inner portal into people's uh, environments for those that allow it to be there. And so in some ways you actually get, uh, you get the opportunity to engage with people on a personal level in ways that maybe we didn't in the office. Um, and I, I do miss the face-to-face -face stuff. I miss sticky notes on the whiteboard and all that kind of fun stuff. But at the same time, Mural and Miro and all these other whiteboarding tools are so powerful that you don't have to worry about somebody going and erasing your whiteboard or taking your stickies down or whatever else. It's there forever and you can actually do the work and you can do it with people all over the country. Um, and from a consulting perspective, I haven't had to travel basically at all in the last year to do the work that I do. Um, and so it's honestly like at the beginning, I think um, the assumption was there were going to be a lot of things that kind of fell apart. And, and honestly, I think we're getting better at better, better and better at figuring this stuff out. Now there are still like, there's one engagement where I'm doing one-on-one -on -one executive coaching. I'd like to have those sessions face to face like across a table or next to each other or whatever. Um, it, it, I think it is, uh, in order to establish that level of trust really, really quickly, um, it helps to have more of an actual eye to eye instead of me staring at a little dot on my screen to make you feel like I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, that's hard, but, um, but otherwise I do think that it's been pretty consistent, honestly, with how I, the, the mechanics of how I coach haven't necessarily changed a whole lot other than some of the different tools that we're using. Mm -hmm. um, if I reflected on that longer, I'd probably come up with a slightly different answer, but that's mm -hmm. off the top of my head. That's, that's kind of what came to me, so. Okay. And last, very last one, yep. and you can edit this out, Steve, okay? No, 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 no. <laughs> I want your question. We want your questions. Everybody wants to hear, hear from so, you. So going back to that TED talk that didn't happen. Yeah. You know, that, that last question that they ask in TED, like if you could harness all of the resources and all of the energy that's in the room to create, to have that one wish, right? What, mm. what would that be for you? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> that's a tough one, man. Because yeah, I have two different, and again, and this, this actually shows you who I am. Like, I've always talked about this weird dichotomy of creative and analytical. And I've, <laughs> I've been both forever and, and like deeply both. And so it, it, it's absolutely odd the way I'll respond in different situations. But um, the first thing that came to mind was that TED talk was really more of a, a personal journey for me um, than it was a professional one. As much as I talked about some of the work that I do, it was really about all this stuff kind of fitting together. And so my energy in that space is about people recognizing that their story, that the story that they're living with their life um, is the same as a book or a movie as far as what creates an engaging one, which is a character that's going after something that's bigger than themselves that has to go through conflict to get it. Um, and and that, that formula is one that if we embrace it as individuals, and I only succeed about 60% of the time, it changes everything because all of a sudden you have to embrace conflict when I used to want to run away from it. Um, so I, I would wish for everybody that they were able to view their lives in that way, because I think it changes how we behave and how we show up and the risks that we take and how we, um, what, how we feel about ourselves as to whether or not we're enough uh, to, to do what we do. And then professionally, um, I really do. I, it's a geeky, I have a geeky passion, man. Like I just, <laughs> I want to see these big freaking companies grow a heart and, and, and do really good work. Um, and it's it, at the end of the day, I, I'm passionate about changing systemic problems um, and helping a lot of people maybe want to get out of bed in the morning and go to work. I hated getting out of bed and going go to do project management. Look at another Gantt chart for another day. <laughs> I, I, I already edited myself for you, Steve, but... Um, so that, that's the other side. Thanks for asking. Thank you. That is awesome. What powerful questions, Anna. I love those. <laughs> we didn't mean to put you on the spot too much, Pete. But, hey, but you, you came through it. I so. told you. 
<laughs> I hope it. You ask, I'll answer. That was that was awesome. I, you know, I would love to continue this conversation, and and maybe we can. So, Pete, if people want to find you, how do how do they, how are they going to reach out to you? One is, you know, all this information is going to be in the show notes, a- along with you know Anna's bio, so we can find out a little bit more about her too and your bio, <laughs> and maybe some bourbon recommendations. You know, may, maybe one or two. We'll or see people how- can put it on the comments since they know you you're going to get your old, journey. You're going to get your bourbon backlog out of this. There we go. go. <laughs> that'll, that'll, be, that'll be nice. That'll be nice. But but how can how can people find you, Pete? Uh, I the the company that I work for is called Three Bridge, uh, and so uh, or Three Bridge Solutions. Uh, so Three Bridge is there. Which used uh, to be. Which used to be Kiat, mm-hmm. uh, which is the company that I started with and merged. And actually, um, we have a soft announcement um, happening right now that there's another merger taking place. Um, and so at the beginning of the year, we will have another new name and we will be a company that is almost 1500 consultants strong, um, about a $260 million organization. Um, so I've gone from having, being the only full-time back office uh, consultant, starting up a product practice almost exactly a year ago today to being responsible for a practice of about 105 agile and product professionals in the new world. So not bad growth for one year. I don't think I can, I don't think I can declare ownership for that growth, but um, I get to at least absorb it and experience it. So it's fun. Um, So, so obviously uh, we'll, we'll include email address and um, LinkedIn and uh, by all means, you can check out the Trello board and all that jazz, but there you go. uh, So it's all going to be in the show notes. And if you do look for Pete Anderson, it's a fairly common name. So if you can't find him, go to Agile World News and, and you'll, fi- you'll find him there. Um, so that, that will be fabulous. And Pete, I, th- I think the fact that you've gone through such growth in the last year and your responsibilities have changed so drastically, that's why you're focusing so heavily on empathy right now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I need them too, to believe me. I'm learning from the fire hose, man. Never, never had to run a $15 million company by, my, by myself from a yeah, you know, we will. So. I'm learning all kinds of new stuff. <laughs> so we well, should do another one a year from now and uncover that great. journey too, right? I think Maybe so. Like- I think so. We could do this in six months or yeah, yes. we'll definitely swing back. To this <laughs> because I think this is, this is just a wonderful topic. Um, and we do do these most every week. So we are trying to bring some serious agile discussions by some, by some wonderful practitioners who have been in the trenches. So this isn't exactly, you know, what, what, what you find in the books. And, um, and we also try to make it fun. So hopefully, you know, Agile World will continue. And if you like what you heard, please come check out the show notes and click subscribe on whichever platform you listen to because we're all over the place. This is a video blog uh, or a vlog. Uh, we're also a podcast. And um, so wherever you find us, click on subscribe. Just let, just let us know what you think and, and comment. We'd love to hear it. Anyway, everyone, Pete, thank you so much. Anna, it's so fabulous to co-host with you. Um, <laughs> you too. Talk, Thank I'm you. I'm to talk her into doing this more, more often. So if you guys like her, let me, let, you know. <laughs> and you can also yeah. find out more about the, the Toronto mentorship, uh, Agile mentorship program <laughs> too. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes as well because it's a wonderful uh, thing. That's where, that's where Anna and I met. So anyway, Thank everyone, you. thank you so much, Pete. This was wonderful. And have a, great, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.